Hi, it's Kat here from The Creative Introvert. So I've been curious about creativity and personality type psychology for quite some time now. However, I did not expect astrology to come into the picture, um, which it has done over the last couple of years. Steadily, it's become a fundamental part of how I see the world, how I view myself and the other people around me. And recently, I decided that it was high time I investigated what the birth chart, the astrological map of the sky, can tell us about creativity and introversion in any individual. And actually, I believe that the astrology of all of this can help us understand what terms like introversion and creativity mean in a deeper, more specific way. So the point of this video is to show you what I found out about the birth chart and what it tells us about creativity and introversion, as well as what we can learn about how we can fulfill our creative potential and learn a bit more about our personality and preferences. So this is what we're going to go through. We're going to start with defining the terms. Um, I'm going to talk about my hypothesis on where introversion and creativity might be found in the birth chart. And I'm going to go through many birth chart examples, starting with some famous creative introverts, uh, as well as the different people who were in my audience and who submitted their birth charts. And I'm going to talk about different types of introversion, um, particularly three of the Myers-Briggs types. I'm going to talk about writers, visual artists, musicians, dancers, and multi-passionates or creatives that have many different uh, creative outlets. So before I dive into the astrology, I think it's worth me defining what I mean when I talk about introversion and creativity. So let's start with introversion. Now, there are many myths and misconceptions about introversion. If you Google the word, you'll find a definition that says introverts are shy and reticent. And I thought this too, until a friend diagnosed me as an introvert and explained what it actually meant, at least in terms that he understood. So now I define it in the way that it's more to do with your energy and your thought process. So an introvert to me is somebody who recharges by spending their time alone and he processes a stimulus or new information slowly and deeply. It also can overlap with other traits like uh, high sensitivity, HSPs, high sens highly sensitive people, shyness and anxiety. But these are different traits. You can be an outgoing introvert or a shy extrovert. Now it's also worth talking about Carl Jung's definition and the Myers-Briggs type indicator because this is kind of where I started with introversion. And it's where a lot of the internet of introverts um, get their definitions from as well. So in 1921, Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung coined the terms introversion and extroversion in his work Psychological Types. In it, Jung described how extroverts engage with external stimuli, stating that extroverts direct their energy outwards towards other people and gain their energy from these encounters. Introverts, however, focus their energy inwards towards more solitary, thoughtful activities. The Myers-Briggs type indicator is based on Jung's definitions and is usually the go-to for a lot of people on the internet, pop psychology fans like myself. It provides us with a four-letter key that points to various functions of the personality, the first letter indicating whether you identify as an introvert or an extrovert. So the definition that the Myers-Briggs uh, type institute, I guess, uh, gives us about introversion is the following. I like getting my energy from dealing with the ideas, pictures, memories, and reactions that are inside my head, in my inner world. I often prefer doing things alone or with one or two people I feel comfortable with. I take time to reflect so that I have a clear idea of what I'll be doing when I decide to act. Ideas are almost solid things for me. Sometimes I like the idea of something better than the real thing. So if you can relate to any of that, you're probably an introvert according to the Myers-Briggs model. Now it's also worth talking about the five factor model, also known as the, um, the big five or the ocean model. And this is very different. This came about in the 1960s with the work of Hans Eysenck. Uh, and it's maybe arguably a more scientific approach. Um, and it was used um, up until very recently as the most uh, reliable personality type model uh, by psychologists. So this describes five different aspects to personality. And one of them is the introvert and extrovert spectrum. Here, 
Introverts are defined as less sociable, less gregarious, less positive emotionally than extroverts. And this kind of puts Jung's definition more into the intellect imagination or the openness domain, um, which is also described by the Big Five model. And this is because Jung emphasizes the way we as introverts direct our mental or emotional energy. So all this means is that a creative introvert who takes the Big Five test might come out as an extrovert who may also be high in neuroticism, and that's what might make us anxious and shy, as well as high on openness, and that's what makes us curious and creative. So what does all of this mean, all of these different definitions? Well, this I think is a really um, good indicator of why labels aren't important. Ultimately, there are many different definitions for all these terms, and in my opinion, it's more important as to how you understand them and how they relate to you. In addition, labels can feel very limiting. I think this is why a lot of people prefer the Myers-Briggs model to the Big Five model, or the Five Factor model, um, because we don't want to be labeled as neurotic. Um, we'd much prefer the definition of introversion to be something creative and you know, sensitive and something that we actually want to uh, be. In addition, we can use these labels as excuses, uh, an excuse to not push ourselves and not push our comfort zones. Uh, just to not leave the house in weeks, using introversion as an excuse in this way is not really helpful. These personality models are always undergoing changes, and maybe so are we. So in that sense, labels um, are definitely limited. However, labels can also be empowering and give us valuable insights. For me, finding out about introversion helps me really accept various aspects of myself that I hadn't until then. Anyway, more important than the results that we're getting from these tests is the realizations we make when we take the tests, when we answer these questions, and when we reflect on what these labels mean to us. How does it feel to identify as an introvert? What does that mean to you? And these are also things to keep in mind when you're learning about your astrology chart too. Just like introversion, there are many myths and misconceptions of creativity. And creativity has had multiple definitions over the years. And I really don't think that there's any single great definition of creativity. But before I get onto the uh, different definitions of creativity, uh, I think it's worth talking about some of the uh, misconceptions around creativity that we might have. So for one, not all artistic activities are creative. I think things like painting, uh, making music, writing, these are all things that we might label as creative. But I think any artist knows that there is a time when they can be phoning it in. There is a time when they're not necessarily being creative, even if they're doing a traditional creative act. For example, if you're just copying somebody's work, you could probably argue that that's not a creative task. And on the flip side of this, not only artistic activities are the things that are creative. So all of those topics that we shove under the broad umbrella of art, aren't the only creative acts. We've got creative engineers, creative scientists, creative mathematicians. And this is something that I wouldn't have believed when I was at school, but since meeting people who are really high up in their field in any of these areas, I can really see how creativity is a massive part of their work. Also, it's not something that is isolated to the right hemisphere of the brain. This is something that I, was, I grew up being told, you know, the the right hemisphere of the brain. If you're left-handed, you're more creative because you're using the right hemisphere of the brain more. In fact, both sides uh, of the brain, as well as the connector in between, the corpus callosum, actually play a really significant role in creativity, just in different ways. And I'll be talking a bit about the different stages of creativity uh, shortly. And finally, not everyone is creative. This is a controversial idea, and it's something that I believed up until more recently. But the way I see creativity is that everyone has creative potential. It's just a matter of whether or not we make the choices that help us realize that. And that's gonna be affected by a lot of different things and many things that we simply can't control. And again, this is where astrology can actually tell us a lot about um, how our creativity might manifest. So let's move on to these uh, definitions of creativity. Uh, two of the definitions that I really like, I think, that tell us a lot of um, different nuances about creativity are one from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, 
uh, who says, creativity is any act, idea or product that changes an existing domain or that transforms an existing domain into a new one. What I like about this definition is that it's very broad and it reminds us that creativity is not limited to artists or musicians. It does, however, require that we have, had to, we have to have some kind of impact on the domain in which we create, which is unfortunate, especially if we just want to create for ourselves. Uh, who's to say that an artist who only creates for themselves and that work never shows the light of day and never gets the opportunity to change a domain isn't creative? I don't think we can say that. And then we've got one from Sir Ken Robinson who says that creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. What I like about this definition is that it emphasizes value. This is something that makes up for Csikszentmihalyi's definition, um, uh, who doesn't state that the creative act has to be valuable, it just has to change something. For example, any destructive act in that case, like smashing a window, creating an atom bomb, can create change, but it doesn't necessarily create valuable change. And if you're interested, from looking at all of these definitions, I would say that creativity is a process. It's taking something that exists in our mind or our imagination and bringing it into the world. Creativity requires our willingness to fail. You know, we never quite get it right. That thing that it's in our heads, trying to replicate that. Well, I think if you've ever tried to create anything, you'll know that it ever really turns out the way you planned. And that's why we keep trying. And I believe that people who can't hack failure stop creating. So now I'll move on to um, how a lot of psychologists, scientists who study this stuff um, describe creativity. And I think it's interesting to talk about divergent and convergent thinking here. So studies suggest that there are these different stages of creativity and there are lots of different ways to chop this up. But very loosely, I think, these two areas, um, moving from divergent to convergent thinking, um, describes a lot of that creative process that I was talking about. So divergent thinking is the process of thinking that explores multiple possible solutions in order to generate creative ideas. It's spontaneous, free-flowing, and non-linear. This is kind of the whiteboard stage when you're just kind of throwing lots of different ideas out there, and many people might be involved in this part of the process. And then you move on to convergent thinking. And this is the process of figuring out a concrete solution to a problem. So you're taking all of those ideas that arose in the divergent stage, and then you're evaluating, assessing, refining, rejecting ideas. So what I think is interesting about uh, the divergent and convergent stages is that we could potentially map these different um, stages onto the different planets. So this diagram is a kind of variation of um, a source from Chris Brennan, uh, the basic natures of the planets. And in this, I've tried to match the different um, keywords associated with each planet in the domicile that they rule and assign each of those to uh, either divergent or convergent thinking. So going from the sun, the keyword associated with the sun in Leo is to emit. And this is part of the divergent stage. This is kind of when we're throwing out, we are emitting ideas. And then we've got the moon in Cancer. And the keyword there is to receive. Again, this is associated with divergent thinking. This is when we're kind of receiving ideas. Maybe it's the intuitive process that we are um, getting ideas from somewhere else. And I think, again, a lot of artists can relate to that uh, feeling. And then we've got Mercury. So in the two different signs that Mercury rules, we've got Gemini and Virgo. So in Gemini, Mercury is argue, and in Virgo, it's destabilize. And these could be more associated with the convergent stage. So you can imagine getting into a room with people and asking, you know, what do you think of my ideas? You've got some people in the room arguing with you, some people kind of trying to shake up or challenge your ideas, and that's Mercury. Then we'll move on to Venus. So Venus in Taurus is to unify. Venus in Libra is to reconcile. And I feel like this is a lot to do with the divergent stage of making connections between ideas and bringing obscure ideas together. Then we've got Mars. 
So Mars is to sever in Aries and to separate in Scorpio. And as you can probably imagine, this is part of the convergent stage where we are cutting out ideas. We're separating the ideas that work from the ideas that won't work, that aren't practical. Then we've got Jupiter. And Jupiter in Pisces is to stabilize and Jupiter in Sagittarius is to affirm. And so this is when we get together maybe with somebody in that divergent stage and they are bringing us even more ideas. They're telling us that our ideas are working and they're adding more fuel to our creative fire. And then we're moving on to Saturn. So Saturn is to reject in Aquarius and to exclude in Capricorn. And again, this is wrapping up the convergent stage where, where we are rejecting everything that's not working, excluding everything that doesn't fit into our final solution to our problem. So in addition to the divergent convergent stages, we could also think about creativity um, into four stages. So kind of breaking it down further from two to four. And these also map onto divergent and convergent thinking. It, it's just a way of getting more specific and clarifying uh, di the different stages. So in the first stage, perception, this is where you're gathering information. You might not have even have committed anything to paper yet. These are still just the seeds or the germs of, of new ideas. In the second stage, conception, you're letting your mind wander and you're stretching your ideas. So this is when you're taking those little seeds of ideas and you're playing with them, you're seeing what they can do. In the third stage, you start making connections between your ideas, and this is expression. You might start actually um, making different models of your ideas, making first drafts. Um, this is also when the light bulb moment might happen. And in the fourth stage, your cre creative ideas need to be polished and assessed before they make their way out into the real world. And this is when we can reflect on our ideas and our creative solutions, maybe get other people's input as well. Uh, and this also happens to mirror the phases of the moon cycle very nicely. So someone who's born in these different phases, there are actually eight stages of the moon cycle, but if you break it down into these uh, four main stages, it also works very well. So if you're born um, at a certain phase of the moon, it might be that you're more inclined to one of these four different stages of creativity. So for example, someone born between the new moon and the first quarter might be seen as somebody who is inclined to the first stage of gathering information and having these new ideas pop up. Someone born in the second stage between uh, the first quarter and full moon, this is when somebody is maybe more inclined to starting to bring ideas together, manifesting things, taking an idea from something very fuzzy to something a bit more um, tangible. And someone born at the full moon stage could be seen as somebody being more inclined to the third stage. Illumination, making connections, bouncing ideas around. And finally, somebody born on the last quarter or between the last quarter and the new moon could be someone naturally inclined to assessing their ideas critically, uh, sorting out the wheat from the chaff, and finally releasing their ideas into the world or spreading them around before starting the cycle again. So this is just a fun theory to play around with. Um, if you're not sure at what stage you were born, what moon phase uh, you were born, uh, then feel free to contact me, hello at thecreativeintrovert.com, and we can talk about it. So my hypothesis. Well, this is going to be me talking about uh, how introversion and creativity might be seen in different ways in the birth chart. So introversion. You can look at a birth chart and see where most of the planets are situated. And this can tell us a little bit about an individual's propensity to um, being more outwardly or inwardly focused. And you can do this in two different ways. So the first way of thinking about this is the upper and lower hemispheres. If you were to look at a birth chart, you will see a, or at least a Western birth chart, you'll see this circle uh, and you'll have either a lot of planets above or below the horizon, or maybe they'll be equally distributed. But one theory goes that the more planets you have in that lower hemisphere, um, the nighttime part of the chart, the more inwardly oriented you'll be, the more private you'll be. And the more planets you have in the 
daytime, the upper half of the chart, the more outwardly focused you'll be, the more um, public display you'll want to have. You can also look at the eastern and western, or the rising and setting sides of the chart. And if you have more planets on that left-hand side, uh, where the planets are rising, then you're more likely to be uh, more independent and more self-motivated. And on the right-hand side, uh, the setting half, this would indicate that somebody is more receptive, interdependent, so other-oriented. And this is a bit of a tricky one, because you might associate the receptive, more passive hemisphere, the setting hemisphere, as being more introverted. But I wonder if that focus on others is more of an extroverted trait, as extroverts do tend to be more socially motivated and other-oriented. Anyway, something to think about in your own chart. In terms of planets and introversion, well, I can't see any one planet being an indicator of intro introversion regardless of what sign or house it's in, though certain configurations are going to affect how introverted or extrovert any planet is gonna manifest in terms of their energy. However, I would look at Saturn as the one planet um, in terms of restriction. So whether that's social restriction or um, isolating yourself, it could be that Saturn is one place we can look for that. Um, for example, if you have Saturn making a square to Mercury, this could indicate some difficulty in speech or communication. Let's say our speech is restricted, we might appear more shy, especially if we therefore choose to speak less. Somewhere else we could look is Saturn being in the first house, as this is the house of self, your psychology. And depending on other factors, this could also indicate that the individual is more inward focused, more quiet, more cautious or shy, uh, self-expression might be more limited if Saturn is in the first house, particularly if Saturn isn't in a good way, if it's not in a sign that it particularly likes to be in, or if it's being afflicted in, in another way. So what about signs of the zodiac? Well, we could look at yin signs. So each sign could be um, described as being either yin or yang. And yin signs are more receptive, maybe more sensitive. And you could say that uh, more uh, introverts are inclined to increased sensitivity. After all, 70% of highly sensitive people are introverts. So signs from um, every other sign are going from Taurus, so Taurus, Cancer, Virgo, and so on. Those are the yin signs. In addition, yin signs are also associated with being either of the water element or the earth element. And one thing I did see in the study that I did was that water signs in particular were dominant moon placements. So that could be a coincidence or could actually mean something. So one thing that surprised me was that you could see fire signs as being thought of as introverted, particularly in the way that uh, Carl Jung described. And I haven't found much information about this, but I did read this interesting quote online from Caleb Grayson who says the introverted signs are fire and water, and the extroverted ones are air and earth. And this is, of course, the Jungian notion of introversion and extroversion. In Aries, for example, may seem extroverted because they engage with, uh, others with themselves, but they are really introverted in that it is their inner self, particularly their feelings, that drive their actions rather than others. So in this way, Caleb is kind of pointing at the motivations behind these different signs. And that uh, fire signs, because they're more inwardly motivated, they're motivated from themselves, number one, uh, that, that makes them a little bit more introverted. But again, something to think about yourself. And really, you could say that every sign could have an introverted or an extroverted expression. It just depends on uh, what's happening where in the chart. So a quote from Liz Green. The extroverted version of any zodiacal sign tends to express himself out in the world. So the extroverted Aries finds challenges in the world. The extroverted Sagittarian explores the world. And the extroverted Pisces projects his visions into the world and so on. The introverted versions of the signs express their nature through an inner reality. So the introverted Capricorn is spiritually or psychologically ambitious. The introverted Sagittarian travels the boundless leagues of the mind and spirit, and the introverted Virgo attempts to order and synthesize himself. 
houses. So having planets in any one particular house, again, won't make you an introvert. The only house that symbolizes the self or personality in the way that I was taught anyway, is the first house. So we could look there, for example, looking at Saturn in the first, like we did. You might also look at the ruler of the first house to see what state it's in. For example, someone with Gemini rising or Gemini in the first house with a Mercury afflicted by Saturn might point to that restriction in speech we spoke about um, and that being a dominant part of their personality. And you might also look at the house that that ruler is in. And the main houses that I'd link to introversion are the eighth house, and this can um, indicate a propensity to anxiety or a sense of dread, and the 12th house. And this can indicate some being more prone to isolation, to go off and um, take themselves away from, from the world. So moving on to creativity. I personally wouldn't point to any one sign for creativity, not even Leo. So I'm ruling that out until someone proves me otherwise. However, houses might be more useful, particularly for seeing how someone's primary creative pursuits might manifest. And this can be found in any house. It just depends on how that individual has expressed their creativity. More generally, however, the main houses that I would look at are the fifth house. So this is associated with imagination, self-expression, play, bringing ideas to life. The 10th house could point to our creative calling or the compulsion to create this creative ambition that kind of drives us regardless of what's good for us. And I've also seen uh, interesting creative topics play out in the sixth house, especially if somebody's creative work is a daily task, almost like a chore. And finally, the 12th house. So this could indicate creativity that comes from spiritual or psychological crises um, or altered states. So next, I'm going to talk about the planets. And these are the most interesting um, here for me in terms of creativity as each planet seems to have its own creative stamp or its own ambition for your creative expression. Starting with the sun. So the sun is the creative spirit, inspiration, the drive to create, ambitious projects, the desire to be seen, and that raw creative urge or will. A quote that might uh, represent this. To show his work is vital for the artist, the sine qua non of his existence. That's a quote from Edouard Manet. The moon. This is creative insight, dreams, intuition, the various phases of creativity, incubation, illumination, dissemination of creative ideas. Nature does nothing without purpose or uselessly. It's a quote from Aristotle. Mercury. This is convergent thinking, writing, speaking, acting, comedy, teaching, creative technology, making connections. A sense of humour is a sense of proportion. That's a quote from Khalil Gibran. Venus. Venus represents fine art, aesthetic work, the appeal to the senses, fashion, principles of gestalt, love songs and poetry. Of course, if music be the food of love, play on. You know who that's by. Mars. This is physical, energetic performances, dance, martial arts, bakers, iron workers, and carpenters. Bakers is there because of fire, not because, you know, Mars likes to eat so much. There is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. It's a quote from Ernest Hemingway. Jupiter. This is divergent thinking, philosophy, philanthropically driven work, large art installations, maximalism. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. You never know what is enough until you know what is more than enough. Quote from William Blake. And Saturn. This is work created in isolation, work created from suffering, giving the formless form, can represent writers and editors. Life without industry is guilt, and industry without art is brutality. From John Ruskin. Uranus. Uranus gives work a shock factor, revolutionary work, it's technical advancement. The truth which makes men free is for the most part the truth which men prefer not to hear. It's 
from Herbert Agar. Neptune. This is work with a dreamlike quality, surrealism, the absurd, Dadaism. Happiness is not an ideal of reason, but of imagination. Manuel Kant. And Pluto. To be subjects, dark subjects, transformative, powerful work. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. It's from Dylan Thomas. It's kind of inspired by the heart on Pluto there. So some famous creative introverts. Let's start with JK Rowling. So you can see that the majority of her planets are in yin signs. Again, could indicate introversion. She also has a stellium in Virgo, ruled by Mercury. So the association here is with writing and Mercury is in its own domicile there in Virgo. It's also interesting that Saturn is in Pisces. And I would suggest that this is the ability to bring form and structure to fantastic ideas. Vincent van Gogh. Vincent is a Cancer rising, which is again a yin dominant sign. We've also got Venus and Neptune in Pisces, which might suggest the dreamlike quality in his paintings. As you know, his paintings did not reflect reality. They're a kind of uh, dreamlike version of reality. Uh, Moon is conjunct Jupiter, and again, this is giving us that uh, idealistic quality. W.B. Yeats, the writer and poet, uh, there's a grand air trine here. The Sun, Moon and Saturn are all in air signs. And this might point to his intellect and the ability to communicate ideas, which did bring him success and notoriety. Uh, Mercury is also conjunct his IC, um, which kind of represents his roots. And his writing was heavily influenced by his family, particularly his father, as well as his, his uh, cultural roots in Ireland. Venus is also conjunct Pluto in the fifth house. And this might point to his obsession with Maud Gonne. Um, who fueled his creativity, and you could say that she was his muse. So now I'm going to tell you about some of the charts that I looked at. Uh, I looked at the charts of 47 self-professed creative introverts, uh, and I spoke to uh, about a dozen of the participants to confirm details about their personality and where creativity shows up in their lives. Some of the questions that I was asking were, so what, what does it mean to be an introvert? Uh, what's your Myers-Briggs type, if, if they knew it? Uh, do they consider themselves to be creative? In what way? What's their main creative pursuit? Uh, so we're gonna start by looking at the social introverts versus the hardcore introverts, because introversion is a spectrum and uh, people kind of fall at different places here. So we're just gonna start with A. Everyone here is anonymous. So A has the sun in Aquarius. Um, and says that they don't feel obliged to hang out with others and they get bored quite easily. So this is different between some introverts who feel uh, like they have to hang out with others. An Aquarius sun isn't necessarily going to feel like that. They're not going to feel obliged. Uh, there's also a stellium in Scorpio. So multiple planets are in Scorpio for, and this is the desire to go deep and a kind of rejection of small talk. Again, this person doesn't want to do that small talk thing. They want to go into the subjects that truly interest them. Next, we have B, um, who has Jupiter in Leo in the first house. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, you're clearly an extrovert. Uh, you're lying to me. <laughs> but you can also see that Jupiter is opposing uh, Saturn and the moon in the seventh house. And this is somebody who says they have, they love to perform. So maybe that's the Jupiter in Leo but they have struggled, especially in the past, with a real lack of confidence around this um, and around everything in life. Um, and that could be indicated by that Saturn and Moon conjunction opposing Jupiter. So now I looked at three different prominent Myers-Briggs types, INFJs, INTJs, and INFPs. So starting with those INFJs, these are the introverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging types. I describe them as con contemplative visionaries whose creative style is driven by the possibilities they see in people and fueled by a rich and complex imagination. N here has the Sun and Mercury in Cancer and the Moon in Scorpio. And these are going to point to that introverted, intuitive and feeling um, functions in particular. C 
has the moon conjunct their ascendant. This might be the intuitive feeling aspect. And Saturn and Mars are in Cancer. And this is the discerning, judging function. M has the Sun and Mars in Cancer, again pointing to that feeling function. And the Moon in Aquarius, which is Saturn, a Saturn rule sign, so this might give that judging quality. Next we have INFPs, who are introverted, intuitive, feeling and perceiving types. INFPs are endlessly curious. These creative types have a vivid imagination, and their work is often autobiographical and poetic in nature. J in INFP has a stellium in Gemini and really desires to keep options open, which is quite, as Gemini's immutable sign, I, I felt that this was quite fitting for the perceiving types. J has cancer rising, so this could be the introverted and feeling uh, functions. And Mars in cancer, which might point to that intuitive quality. Next we have S. So S has the moon conjunct the ascendant points to the feeling, and Jupiter in Pisces square Saturn in Sagittarius. So Saturn is in Jupiter's sign here, and I would say that Jupiter would certainly represent the perceiving, this idea of wanting to keep options open. Next we have T. Jupiter is in Pisces square Saturn as well in, in Sagittarius, so that's that perceiving function, just like we saw in S's chart. And finally, the INTJs. NTJs are introverted, intuitive, thinking and judging. Time alone is spent gathering intangible concepts and con contemplating, dreaming and visualizing. They compile their discoveries to create surprisingly original work. We've got A here with the Scorpio Delium, and this might point to the introverted, intuitive functions. And they have a Capricorn Ascendant with a Stellium in Capricorn and the Sun in Aquarius, which is also a Saturn rule sign. And this is where the thinking and judging, very much Saturn qualities come in. H has a Cancer Ascendant with the Sun in Scorpio, which will point to the introverted intuitive side, and the Moon is in Capricorn, judging. P has a Scorpio Ascendant, which would point to them being introverted, as it's a yin sign, and a stellium in Virgo, so Virgo is ruled by Mercury, and this would point to the thinking and judging functions. So now we're going to look at different types of creative pursuits and how the different creative introverts show up there. So starting with the writers, Jay has the sun and a stellium in Gemini. Jay is a writer and specializes in social media marketing. Uh, Jay also has a blog for INFPs and Jays. And this might also suggest that rising Scorpio in the fifth has some kind of effect on their creative work. Uh, Jay's also interested in poetry, particularly turning uh, poetry into music or putting words with music. And this might be that Mercury in Taurus, um, the Venus in Gemini, Mercury and Venus are in mutual reception of each other. So I can really see how the words and the music, words, Mercury, music, Venus, come together there. Next, we have S with um, Mercury in Virgo, which is making multiple aspects to different planets. And uh, S is an editor. We've also got Sun, Trine, Saturn. So giving ideas form. And this uh, person really likes to take the, these ideas in her head and as a writer, gives them form. Uh, the Moon is conjunct their ascendant in Libra. And they're also passionate about social justice which is very Libran. And next we have V. Uh, v is a keen writer and with a stellium in Gemini, Mercury in Gemini, that's no surprise. Next we've got some visual artists, so uh, makers of different things and uh, painters, photographers, stuff like that. We have A, who is a mosaic artist. We've got Taurus in the fifth house, um, Venus ruling the fifth. So this is the desire with her creative work to make things tangible, things that she can sense and touch. Uh, it's all those beautiful things. And from seeing her mosaics, this is very true, definitely something that she's done. Uh, Venus is also in Sagittarius, um, and there is a stellium in Scorpio, which uh, kind of brings about this emphasis on meaning and depth. So this person isn't just 
making things purely to look pretty. Uh, they also want to bring in um, a deeper meaning to their work. Next we have H. So Venus is conjunct Mars in Sagittarius in the sixth house. And this person worked as a costume designer for most of their life. So Venus being that um, representing costumes, uh, Mars, I imagine, is being somebody who's like cutting materials and fabrics. So this is happening in the sixth house, which isn't necessarily related to creativity, but uh, the ruler of the fifth house is that Mars in the sixth. Next, we have P, uh, who has a stellium in Virgo and has uh, Pisces in her fifth house. P's work is very small scale. She makes jewelry. Um, it's very detailed, and this is all the Virgo um, qualities. And it also has an abstract, otherworldly quality to it, which would be the Pisces in the fifth house of creativity. And as you can see, Mercury is, is in Virgo, so even more emphasis on that um, detailed uh, oriented work. Next, we have some musicians. So O here has uh, Gemini as uh, her fifth house, and Mercury, ruler of Gemini, also the ruler of stringed instruments, is in the first house, Aquarius. And this person is a cellist, and that's her big passion in life. Next, we have some dancers. So L here has Jupiter in Pisces in the fifth house. And Pisces, I found, is the sign associated with the feet, which I think is interesting. Um, and L is a dancer and does multiple styles of that dance. So I imagine Jupiter being abundance, many things, and this person. Uh, enjoys all the different styles. Uh, B here with Jupiter in Leo in the first house loves to perform um, particularly um, acting out emotions so that kind of emotional maybe fiery quality from from Leo. And finally we have multi-passionates creatives who have many creative outlets and we've got E here with the fifth house um, in Pisces uh, and Jupiter in Pisces and Pisces is a mutable or a double-bodied sign and can point to um, having pursued many different creative activities, um, having stuck with them for a while and maybe uh, quite easily and swiftly changed onto something else. And E has done lots of different creative pursuits and describes herself as a jack of all trades. S has also had many different jobs and I thought it was interesting that their sixth house is Pisces, which is another mutable double-bodied sign. Um, and Jupiter, the ruler of Pisces, is in Gemini, another double-bodied sign. So in conclusion, there are countless ways to express creativity and introversion. And rather than forcing ourselves through a series of scientifically verifiable multiple choice questions, the study of astrology allows us to see the diverse ways creativity and introversion can show up in our lives. And with these insights from our birth chart, we can get to know how to best express ourselves and channel our creative potential in a way that fits us best. So did I spot any patterns? Did I find any planetary signatures that determine whether we're going to be an introvert or not? Well, not really. There was no Mars effect, at least none that I could uh, work out, even though at times I thought I had. Instead, I worked out that creativity and introversion are as multifaceted as we are. And the coolest part is that I've realized that these bizarre maps of the planets and stars can actually tell us in creepily accurate depth what we're capable of in terms of our creative potential and what we're karmically dealing with in terms of our personality type and the challenges that we might face. So if you're interested in learning more about what your personal birth chart can tell you about creativity and introversion and some of the things that I've discussed today, well, I'd love to chat to you about it. I'm offering astrology readings now, and as this is a brand new offering, I'm offering the first 12 signups a 50% discount. So to book a 90 or 60 minute astrology reading, there are different options uh, for creative introverts. Just click on the link below where you can visit thecreativeintrovert.com slash astrology. And there you'll find much more information about the kinds of readings that I'm offering. Thanks for watching and I'll hopefully be back soon with more updates on astrology, creativity and introversion.